Here in Long Beach, New York, on the south shore of uh, Long Island, uh, it's a beach community, a barrier island. I've lived here for 30 years. All over town, there is um, just devastation. Every street, you can see the street I'm on here, Nevada, there's a couple of feet of sand on it. The sand is piled in mounds by bulldozers now. It's, uh, in some corners, it's 10 feet high. I'm homeless. <laughs> Yeah. And we just renovated last year, <laughs> so everything's brand new and everything's destroyed. My life keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's about rebuilding the life and making it back to where it was, you know, in terms of developing things. People don't have, uh, because they don't have access to water, FEMA has come in. We got our FEMA package, thanks to the United States government <laughs> and our water. I saw a man on a bicycle. He was riding, trying to carry a couple of uh, cases of uh, water and uh, food, and he was falling. And a man driving by in a pickup stopped him, didn't know him, asked him, um, "Can I give you some help?" The first time that I saw of any kind of help or assistance, we were picking up water. We have five people in the house. There is no sewage or water in in Long Beach, and so on almost every corner you'll find a porta potty. We had some water. We were going out with the drain water pouring down. The toilet, right? You know, it was very 19th century. There have been fires in town. I start screaming, fire, car fire, car fire. We didn't want the car to explode, right? You know, right so right. we, you know, we're all working, working. We feel like we're we're gaining on it. All of a sudden, we see that there's embers going um, underneath the siding of the house. We lost it. We lost the battle. I mean, the wind was too strong. Seven houses in that neighborhood went up in fire, totally destroyed. There is a two-mile boardwalk in Long Beach. It's totally destroyed. The first thing I had to do was check out the boardwalk. I just couldn't believe it. Didn't expect it. The only flag in Long Beach up. Yeah, right. <laughs> when did you put it back up? Yesterday. I meet people and almost everybody says the same thing. They're thankful no one was killed here. They're thankful they have their lives, but they know they just have so much to do in the months to come. put the uh, shades up again you were welcome to do so <clears throat> so is the shift from power to powerless still fresh in your minds do you know what time your power went out do you know what you did when the power went out do you know how long it took before you stopped trying to turn switches on <laughs> and saying to yourself Duh! I know the power is out <clears throat> How long did it cut before you actually began to think, what am I going to do? I'm not prepared for this. What if it goes for a week? And then, for some of us, it actually did. And um, there was some, some real concern in terms of, uh, you know, how, what, what about all the food that I have in my refrigerator, all the food in my freezer? And if you have several of them, it was a lot of stuff that could have been lost, or for some of us, was lost. And just sitting in the dark. Um, I think uh, candles are nice, and uh, oil lamps are nice, but uh, it's, to me, it's just another form of darkness. It's, I like it really bright. So there were things like that that were happening. There were uh, opportunities to help people. Uh, there were cleanups that needed to happen in people's homes outside. Uh, we lost shingles, uh, not a whole lot, but we lost some. And others lost one third of their roof from our church uh, because of the winds. I think that our area was spared a great deal of uh, the damage, damage that could have happened. But when these things happen to you, they have a way of just sh shaking you deeply within. And, uh, and they, they make you think about, well, what if this didn't end? What if this was going to go on forever? And what if this is a whole new normal? How would, I, how would I respond to this? What will I do? What, 
the, 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 the grocery store is closed and I can't get food. I have to travel all the way to Hatfield now to get food. No, that's not true now, but uh, the, the, uh, the giant in Percocy was closed and people were thinking, all right, I gotta make changes. I gotta make shifts and uh, make things happen, make them work. For some of us, that was really unsettling. I mean, for many of us others, um, it was just like, oh, that was fun. You know, we, we uh, like adventure. Uh, okay, maybe that's the minority. And the rest of us sort of did not like it to a high degree. And were very unsettled by the changes that came into our lives. This is what is going on in David's life in the chapter that we're studying. Go to first. Samuel and chapter 21. First Samuel 21. <clears throat> Sometimes you can read the Bible and say, you know what, that's interesting, but never really enter into it. Never feel like that person is like me. And I can relate to what it is that's happening to him in his life. For David, this was a horrific time in his life. Things were going pretty well. I mean, he was a successful uh, military leader in Israel. He was highly respected by the people. He was the son-in-law of the king. He had married the king's daughter. I imagine that he had all the amenities that life could offer to an Israelite in those days. And life was was good but then things began to crumble and they began to crumble quite quickly it was like hurricane sandy hitting his life they began with the darkness gathering around and then the winds and he could see that he was losing his connection with king saul he wanted to serve king saul he wanted to be the best military leader that he could possibly be for him he was greatly in love with Israel. He wanted to preserve and protect Israel. But somehow or other, his successes, which benefited everyone, and more than anyone else, King Saul, actually it turned it all around. And, and Saul was actually beginning to hate him. And he was doing things that were like crazy. I mean, like throwing spears at him. Now, some of this could have been explained by the demon that had been placed in his life. Everybody was pretty much aware in the circles that uh, around the court uh, and that day that uh, something was not right with King Saul. He had these temper tantrums, and he had this depression that overwhelmed him at times. And he said things and did things that people knew that something was off. And then David was trying to help him with that by playing his harp. His harp had good effect and caused Saul to calm, but at other times it caused him to get more angry. And in those times we've read about already, he cast a spear at David twice and missed him both times. And then there was the days that followed in which Saul was actually sending men to his house and waiting for him to come out and he was going to kill him there. Then he sent men to go and get him in his bed and bring him so that he might kill him. And then uh, after David fled to where Samuel was staying in Ramah, we see Saul sending groups of men, perhaps soldiers, after David to, uh, to capture him and to kill him. I don't know about you, but having my lights out is, is not that bad and, and having you know house cold is not that bad imagine having all the things that we have seen on TV and then also at the same time have someone stalking you someone who was powerful and had influence and who was who was slamming your reputation making others believe the things that he was saying and he had power to get at you and you know, even if God at the very end where we read last week, about where the, the groups of men came to where Samuel was with the prophets, and these men began prophesying with the prophets, three groups of them and sitting down and prophesying with him, worshiping God with him, and then finally Saul coming himself with an entourage, and they all worshiping too, and Saul doing it all the way on the way as well from the uh, cistern. 
it, it was uh, obviously a, a demonstration of the power of God. But then as we, as we thought about this, and as a, David uh, runs back to his home, he, he goes to Jonathan and said, John, Jonathan, what's going on here? What is happening? And Jonathan says that he's, he's not aware of what's happening. He's not aware of what his father is doing. And how, how could it possibly happen if his, because his father never lets anything get by without telling Jonathan what he's going to do. And, and, and it's hard for him to believe that, uh, that he doesn't know about these things. But they make a plan about how they can reveal or cause Saul to reveal his true heart to, to Jonathan. And, he, and they, they concoct this plan where, where David's going to say, or Jonathan's going to say that David went home for sacrifice. And he could not be at the sacrificial meal at, uh, at the king's house. And, and the king, first day, would say, you know, okay, he's, he's unclean, he's not here, no problem. The second day, however, the, where cleanness was not an issue, he's still not there, he's angry now. Why is this young man not here, the son of, of Jesse? And then he, he is furious about it, and Jonathan defends David, and Saul throws a spear at him, and Jonathan knows, okay, he knows that his father's really intending to kill David. Uh, and so he needs to warn him. He walks, stalks out of the room furious, not because his father threw a spear at him, which would be all of us. We would have felt that way. But his concern was that he was furious because David was being treated so badly. Well, he goes to David and he tells him, you've got to leave and you have to leave for good. Now, when you have a relationship as close and as loving and as deep as the one that Jonathan and David shared with each other, this is not an easy thing. You don't just say goodbye and, yeah, I'll not think about you again kind of thing. But these men had made covenants with each other because of the, 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 the one-heartedness. For David then to leave him and know that he may not see him again was terribly depressing and so he makes good his escape in verse 1 of chapter 21 we find David who is you know first of all is running so fast from Saul that he has no provisions he has no weapons he has no entourage nobody is with him and he is thoroughly upset over the fact that he had to say goodbye to his best friend Jonathan he is now coming to this place called Nob. And Nob is the place where the tabernacle is being kept. Now, it's not the same place where the ark is. The ark is at Kiriath Jerim. But the tabernacle is in the place called Nob. It is a priest's city. And so they are continuing on there at that place, the place of worship of God, of Yahweh. <clears throat> David has been there many, many times. He never goes out on a mission without first going there to get the word from God concerning that mission and to confess sin and to worship God and thank him for his sovereign lordship in his life and all those kinds of things. So the priests know him by name. Okay, they know him really well. And so they have never seen him arrive in the condition that he is arriving in this moment. David went to Nob to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech trembled when he met him. And he asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? A person of David's importance would never travel alone. He would always have a bodyguard with him because he is vital to the interests of the government of Israel. And so, and since he has come many times, I'm sure that Ahimelech not only knows David thoroughly, he also knows all of the bodyguard. You know, it's like this is hold home week and this is totally not right. So David has to give an answer to him. David answered Ahimelech the priest. The king charged me with a certain manner and said to me, No one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. Now, 
Let me just stop here for a moment. It's important that you understand the kind of literature that we are, that we are reading. The Bible has many different types of literature. Each one should be interpreted according to the kind of literature that it is. This is called historical narrative. You probably will never keep that in your mind, but for today, remember this. It is historical narrative. In other words, it's a story telling you history. Now, you do not... You do not interpret the story that is giving you history in the same way that you interpret epistles in the New Testament, where, like, for instance, the Apostle Paul is teaching you how to live, and he's teaching you how to relate to God. And so when you read that kind of literature, you are saying, what are you telling me to do? And so I will obey what you say. However, in the Old Testament, where we're reading historical narrative, we're simply reading what happened. It does not bear the same force in the sense that you must do likewise. Okay? So what we are reading is what David did. And it's not telling us those that, so that we will follow his example. Now... When he does right, you do want to follow his example. That's true. But the, the purpose of this literature is simply to tell you what happened. Now there is a theme in, that covers the whole of First and Second Samuel. And that theme, using stories of that actually happened, is relating to us that God is king and revealing that in the lives of different people as we go along. So we do indeed learn things that apply to our lives by reading this kind of literature, but you have to be careful how you apply it to your life because it's telling you what happened, not what ought to happen. Okay? Sometimes it tells you what ought to happen, but it will say so. Or it will be clear because other parts of the scriptures tell you that's what you ought to do or ought not to do. So we want to keep that in mind as we're interpreting here what's going on with David. So David tells Ahimelech, the priest, um, a fabrication. All right? This is not true. <laughs> you understand? Does that bother you? It should. It should. He says, he says, the king charged me with a certain manner, matter and said to me, no one is to know anything about your mission and your instructions. Did the king do that? I don't read it anywhere. I don't think it's likely that it happened. Why is he saying this? Well, some commentators will look at this passage and say, this is a sad day in David's life. David, instead of trusting in God like he did when he went out and fought Goliath, decided not to trust God, but lied about what was going on so that he wouldn't get into trouble. Is that what's happening here? You have to face that. That is, a regular, that is a possibility if you're looking at what the different possibilities might be. It is a possibility that he is afraid that he'll get caught and that he'll get in trouble, so he's lying his way out of it. He's trying to get some food, but he doesn't want, the, he doesn't want a him like telling King, David, King Saul what's going on. Well, is that really what's going on? Others have said, well, you know what? The king that he's referring to is King Jehovah. King Jehovah has sent me on a mission. Okay, I suppose you could say that, that indeed God has told him to flee and, uh, and God has got him on a secret mission because God hasn't told anybody else it. And I'm not even sure that David knows what the mission is yet either. But David knows that Ahimelech isn't interpreting it that way. So he is de he's deceiving him. Even if he does believe that King Jehovah is the one he's talking about, it's still intended to deceive the priest. Well, I don't know. That, that doesn't seem like a really great option for me either. Well, here's another one. How about this? David knows that if Ahimelech knows what he's doing in aiding and abetting David in his fleeing from Saul, he will be in grave danger. He knows that Saul will kill.
kill him. So he is telling him a lie to preserve his life. Now that isn't how it ends up. Because it actually ends up in the next chapter. I should just tell you to read it, but I won't. <laughs> in the next chapter in which Ahimelech will be killed. And all of the priests as well. But this was David's attempt at saving his life. I cannot tell you, Ahimelech, what I'm doing here or where I'm going. Because if I do, it will kill you. And so, I will lie to you. I will tell you I'm on a mission, and that it was a very important mission, a secret mission, and I need some, pres uh, some, re I need some help, some food, and I need a weapon. So is that all right? Is that okay to do that kind of thing? Uh, okay, so I got one vote now. <laughs> the answer here is no. Unfortunately, that isn't the kind of world in which we live. There are times in which we are required to deceive in order to preserve a higher right. What about the women who, who did not kill the, uh, the Israelite babies when Pharaoh said that these midwives were to go and kill the children? The midwife said, well, we don't seem to make it there in time. These Israelite women have their babies really fast. And we just don't get there in time to, have, you know, to, to, to stop the, the, uh, the birth. God commends them for this. But they're deceiving. They are lying, aren't they? How many of you leave the lights on in your house? Or you have devices that turn on the lights when you're not there? So that the burglars who would have come in will actually think that you're home. You're deceiving them, aren't you? And you don't feel bad about that, do you? Is that a sin? I don't think so. There are people that do not deserve the truth. They don't deserve to know whether you're home or not if their intention is to steal you blind. All right? Now, I know I'm heading into areas that are not a little dangerous here because people can interpret things in a, in a wrong way. But I sincerely believe that those who in the times of Second World War who were hiding Jews in their homes in Holland from the Nazis, saying that they had no one there when they actually did, were doing what was right. But they were lying. Some of them refused to lie in that process. And they, were, they, they wanted to trust God. That was their choice, and maybe that is God, how God led them. But I do not condemn those who said, there's no one here. You will find no one here, knowing that there was somebody there. Because those who had come to take them away, to kill them, did not have the right to know. Now, ordinarily, in your life, in my life, in the way we live, everybody has a right to know most everything that we should tell them. And that's why we're told not to lie, but to tell the truth, to be honest and forthright, and to be genuine, because that is what God is. He is indeed genuine. But God even himself uses deceit for his purposes. Now, I know this is going to really grab you, but we go back to the time of Ahab when he was fighting alongside Jehoshaphat. And we read that there is a picture of God speaking to the denizens of heaven about how is he going to deceive Ahab into going into battle in which he will die because God is going to judge him for his sins by killing him in battle. And there's a spirit that comes forward and says, I can do that. And says, I will be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of his prophets. And they will tell him that it will succeed. And God says, that will work. Go do it. And so he sends a deceiving spirit. 
down and he deceives Ahab. Ahab is led into battle because God used that to judge him. So when David is lying to Ahimelech to save his life, I don't think that David is sinning when he does so. Tonight we will be studying Psalm 34, if you're interested in coming, at 6 o'clock. In that passage, he tells people to live holy lives telling the truth as being part of those holy lives they should live. And he writes this particular psalm in the cave of Adullam after he returns after being here at Nob and being with Achish in the city of Gath where he deceives Achish by pretending to be a madman because his conscience is clear it was the right thing for him to do and he was shrewd before Achish because that was what was required so here we have David under extreme duress and the thing that I want you to notice is not about whether it was right or wrong for him to say what he said but the very fact that his concern like Jonathan's was when the spear came at Jonathan Jonathan was actually angry about how David was being treated here David now is running from Saul and he is being persecuted his home is being taken away his family is being taken away his possessions are being taken away his job is being taken away his life is in danger of being taken away and who is he thinking of? he's thinking of Ahimelech and his safety he does not want him to be in danger because of the things that are happening to himself this is a picture I want us to carry into the communion service. And time after time after time, Jesus was persecuted and even on the cross, we see him being nailed to the cross and the words that come out of his mouth are, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As he was suffering, it was his attention was upon us and our needs and his desire that we would be one with him. What a lesson to take away from this situation. Many of us have hardships now, even that continue after the storm is over. We're thinking about all the cleanup in our yard. We're thinking about the damage on our roofs. We're thinking about the damage uh, of the tree that's laying over on our garage or whatever it may be. But in those situations, let it not be that you are simply thinking about yourself, but you are thinking about the needs of others. That is the pattern that is set forth here in this passage and in the life of Jesus and to the life that Jesus calls us to when he says take up your cross and follow me let's bow for your prayer <clears throat> Heavenly Father I thank you for your mercy and for your grace I thank you Lord that you saved us in the real world in which we live a sinful world that forces us into situations where we must make choices sometimes between a lesser evil or a greater evil. We rejoice that there will come a time when there will be a place for us to live where those choices are and will not be the same. Where there is only holiness and righteousness and submission to your will. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you made the choice to go to the cross. 
even as you were being crucified, you were preparing a way for us. Everyone thought it was about your suffering and, and how you deserved it. But in fact, you were the lamb that was suffering in our place. How we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together a song that reminds us of the hope that we have in the Lord.